All right, welcome to Speaking for Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley, that dude. Coming up, we'll tell you if LeBron will ever get a superstar teammate. And I've got another installment of the <laughs> da, 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 <laughs> Emmy Award winning that dude's dude. But we start every day with a Whitlock. What you got today, big dog? All right, today there's a headline in the Dallas Morning News that states the playing field between Dak Prescott and Carson Wentz has been leveled. Mm -hmm. It's written by Tim Kalashaw, a newspaper columnist I respect. But let's don't kid ourselves four days before the Eagles and the Cowboys meet for control of the NFC East. Prescott, <laughs> about Prescott and Wentz, quarterbacks from the same draft are not on the same playing field. They're barely on the same planet. Dak Prescott has started all 12 games this season and thrown just 14 touchdown passes. That's the same number as Case Keenum. It's one more than Blake Bortles. It's four fewer than Wentz, who missed the first two games of the season. Has Dak Prescott improved with the addition of receiver Amari Cooper? No question about it. Dak hasn't thrown an interception during Dallas's four-game winning streak, but he's fumbled the football at least once in three of the last four games. No question Carson Wentz has taken a step back from a year ago when he was an MVP candidate. But Wentz isn't in Dakland. Dakland is Sackland. Mm. It's a neighborhood in Dallas where quarterbacks lack confidence, hold the ball, absorb unnecessary sacks, and fumble the football. Wentz isn't afraid to turn the ball loose. He's not afraid to throw a receiver open with pinpoint placement. I've lost no confidence in Wentz as a future franchise quarterback. I expect him to play well and outperform Prescott this Sunday. On the surface, that sounds elementary. But you have to remember, Wentz is going to be playing the Dallas defense, the unit that just shut down Drew Brees and the Saints. Remember last week when Jerry Jones told the Cowboys to treat the Saints game like a Super Bowl? What do you do after you played in a Super Bowl? You relax. You celebrate. The Cowboys won't be able to match Philadelphia's emotional energy this week. This week is Philly's regular season Super Bowl. The Eagles will have the emotional advantage over Dallas. Sunday's game will be Wentz's opportunity to reestablish himself as an elite quarterback. He'll use the game as a platform to prove he's not remotely on Dak Prescott's level. The difference in this game will be Carson Wentz being better than Dak Prescott. All right, joining the desk now are former NFL star Sean Merriman and D'Angelo Hall. Marcellus, we will start with you. Yeah. Should we pump the brakes on saying that Dak is closing the gap on Carson Wentz? Hell yeah. Who even hit the gas on that one? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Tim Callishaw. Woo, Tim. <laughs> Talking about home cooking right there. That's some love right there. Uh, look, the only way that Dak is closing the gap is because Carson Wentz this year, compared to his MVP campaign last year, is backing up just a step. Um, but he's playing himself into form. They're not on the same level. And it's okay. It's not an indictment on Dak. You're talking about comparing him to another young stud who was an MVP candidate before injury. Dak has never been an MVP candidate. I mean, even in his rookie year, we were just like, wow, overachiever. Wow, maybe the franchise is in good hands post-Romo. But no one ever put him in an MVP conversation. I'm not going to insert him right now. You look at his quarterback rating, 95. Applause. You look at Carson Wentz, who took a step back, 101. Still playing better with one and a half knees. So respect to what Dak has done, but Carson is still greater. Do you know what Dak did as a rookie? Hmm. He protected the football. Protect his house. And if he can pr protect the football moving forward, he can absolutely be on the same playing field as Carson Wentz. Now, Dak isn't going to do it the way Carson Wentz does it. He's not going to sit back and throw the ball 30, 40 times a game. He's going to rely on his run game. He's going to protect the football. And he's going to take his shots when he needs to. I played against both of these guys. Hmm. And to me, it's not a real big difference because Dak uses his legs kind of like Cam Newton does. And Carson Wentz is going to throw the ball, but he can use his legs as well, kind of like an Aaron Rodgers. I'm not saying he's Aaron Rodgers, but, like, those are the two guys. Doesn't mean Cam Newton wasn't an MVP. It just means they, they win different ways. And I, I absolutely think Dak <laughs> is a lot closer than – to, to Carson Wentz, the no. numbers don't lie. Yo, the numbers I don't lie. Those games. Just look at the look at the wins Boy, they, and losses. Y'all really selling this selling this game. They're trying to hype it up. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't in the I, I just I don't. This is what I understand. Dak Prescott right now is taking 
credit for what the team is doing. Mm. The defense is playing well. They're playing well in other phases of the game, and Dak Prescott is kind of riding the pony a little bit, and he's getting the credit for it. We just showed a clip of, of, of Wentz, Carson Wentz rolling out of the pocket and throwing that accurate pass. Yeah. Dak Prescott couldn't do that to save his life, and that's, that's how I compare these guys. Yeah. If one-on-one across the board, Dak Prescott is nowhere near what Carson Wentz is. Carson Wentz is coming off a knee injury. People don't understand that when you have a big knee injury like that, yeah, you can play in six months, eight months, but you're not completely comfortable to 12 and 14 months. So he's working his way back in. He's getting comfortable in the field again. And that's why when, when you see later on this, these last few games, he's really going to start turning up because he's now confident in his body. And we're starting to see that. We didn't see that early on during the year. Right. He, was, he wasn't confident. You he, talk about that throw on the run, on outside the, run. the pocket. You talk about the touchdown pass right. extending the play outside the pocket. That's his formula. His formula is to extend plays, to go out there and use his arm talent. Whereas I really don't know what Dak's formula is other than two of his three years, he's had great defenses. Yep. Two of his three years, two plus, with Ezekiel Elliott in the run game, but the suspension obviously undermined that. But you're correct. He is taking credit in a large sum for what is surrounding him, right. which is usually a great defense and but, usually a great running game. But why is that surrounding him? It's surrounding him because they have the money to do that. Moving forward, Dak is who he is. Dak was drafted, what, in the third round, 100 and something pick. Fourth round, I think. Fourth round pick, okay? Mm -hmm. He's going to probably get a contract around the ballpark of 15 to $18 million moving forward if Dallas chooses to make him the guy. Oh, Carson yeah. Wentz is going to get 30-plus million. Okay. And so his team is going to rely heavily on him. Mm -hmm. Dak's team's not going to have to rely solely on him to win every ball. But game. you know you and have. That's the you, way you build. You have made this conversation grander than the, the question. But that's the difference in building these teams. I, I don't mind it's, making it grander. I, I'm shocked though, as a defensive back, if you're sitting there as a defensive back, you're like, I see Dak Prescott on the schedule and I see Carson Wentz on the schedule. As a defensive back. It can't be close. Now, the first time I played against Dak Prescott, I'm looking at his college film. I said, there's no way this kid's going to beat us. And then I sat there and I watched him use his run game. The protection was great in the pocket, so he didn't have a lot of pressure on him. I saw him make really, really good throws to, to, to really good players around him. And I think that's the formula for him. He's going he's gonna to be able to make those easy plays, but he's going to, I mean, Dallas moving forward is going to have to get a tight end. They're going to spend some money on the tight end. Obviously, they're going to spend money on Amari Cooper. They're going to probably get another guy opposite Amari Cooper. Philly's not going to have that luxury. Moving forward, when, 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 when Carson Wentz is getting paid $30 million plus, who are going to be the guys around him? So Carson is absolutely going to have to be just naturally better than Dak Prescott ever will have to be to be considered the same in that category because you you get judged off wins and losses at the end of the day. What's, what is y'all's response, Marcellus, to I think Dallas is going to have a hangover here. I mm. think they unloaded everything against the Saints. I think Jerry told them it was their Super Bowl. <laughs> they treated that. it like a Super Bowl. And again, they're going to back off, whereas I think Philly – is going to be all in. This, they're in desperation mode. Huge emotional advantage for Philly. I think both teams come out full throttle. I don't expect a hangover because Dallas is still trying to figure things out offensively with the addition of Mari Cooper. It's been a month, but um, you can see where he's had some tremendous success and then some times where they need to get him fully integrated into this offense. Ezekiel Elliott is doing well, but just a little rocky at the top. You could have even more out of Zeke, but this defense is rolling, so they're feeling themselves. So the offense is like, hey, we don't want to get left too far behind. Full throttle. However, they have put those underdog masks back on in Philadelphia. And remember that mindset they had last yeah. year that gave them the momentum and propelled them to a Super Bowl championship. Beware of dog, because the dog is coming from Philly this week. I think it's going to be a great three quarters of football. I think the Dallas defense is going to keep them in the game. I think Amari Cooper and these guys are going to step up. But what it's going to come down to when the game is on the line, the ball is in Carson Woods' hands and the, other, and the ball is in Dak Prescott's hands. Carson Wentz will go out and make the plays, and Dak Prescott will not. And that's what the game's going to I don't think it's about just Dak Prescott. It's about Ezekiel Elliott and that offensive line and Amari Cooper. I think that Philly has a chance to win this game, but it doesn't even matter if Philly wins this game because at the end of the day, Dallas' road to win the division is, I think, a heck of a lot easier than, uh, than Philly's road is. Mm. Do you think, though, give me a prediction on this game, will there be a hangover for Dallas? Do you think they'll be able to match I think they'll be Philly's able to match desperation? It. I think they'll be able to match Philly's desperation. I mm. do. I do.
Didn't Carson Wentz retire you, but Dak made you want to come back one more year? Like, this is not how it went on film. Like, you over here. Carson, Carson Wentz, my last time in Philly, I actually scooped the fumble and ran it in for a touchdown. Oh, so, so, we oh, won the division. so you're a prisoner of that moment. Yeah, nah, Carson nah, Wentz ain't nah, that. He might be having that moment. hangover. I, I also saw him escape. <laughs> I got a sack on also, Orlando Pace. I also day. saw him escape three or four defenders, Carson Wentz, yeah. and throw the ball downfield. So, yeah. it's no doubt in my mind Carson Wentz is the better quarterback, but it's. it's, it's better it's, situation. Yeah, yeah, better situation. situation. Yeah, I get it. Ever wonder how to get the hottest new sneakers, the ones that barely hit shelves? The answer is StockX, a revolutionary new marketplace for buying and selling 100% authentic sneakers, streetwear, watches, and handbags. Millions are already using StockX to find everything after it sells out. From the latest Yeezys to every retro Jordan to the hottest new streetwear from brands like Supreme, Bape, Palace, and Kith. StockX even allows users to buy and sell pre-owned, excellent condition, luxury handbags and watches from brands like Louis Vuitton, Chanel, Gucci, Rolex, Omega, Tudor, and more. StockX gives you access to tons of historical price data so you can see exactly how much an item has sold for in the past and how much it's selling for now. Best of all, StockX has removed all the risk from buying and selling online. They provide total anonymity between buyer and seller. StockX is in the middle, so you never have to deal with the random buyer or seller again. And they have experts who verify every item, making sure everything you buy is 100% authentic. Never get burned by fakes again. Go to StockX.com speak. StockX, now you know. D'Angelo Hall and Sean Merriman are back. Time for Marcellus to show us the best plays from big guys around football. What you got, Marcellus? Got to show some love in them trenches where them big uglies reside. <laughs> Jason Whitlock's house and my house. You know what I'm saying. It's all time for Dat Dudes Dudes. Let's start off with our third Dat Dudes Dude of the Week, the Browns defensive end, Miles Garrett. -na -na -na. Inspector Garrett coming around the corner. You can see him. Oh, not only a sack on Deshaun Watson, but a sack on offensive tackle. Let's see how he gets it. First, he comes out of his stance, and he realizes, oh, I got a chipper over there. All right, Lamar Miller, let's make sure. Oh, you don't want to chip me, Lamar Miller? Oh, business casual, as Jason Whitlock would call that. You're supposed to chip me, but then you don't chip me. Nice business decision. So now it throws Miles Garrett off just a little bit, and guess what? His chest is wide open. He gets stabbed right there by the offensive tackle, but then Miles Garrett realizes, oh, okay, you stabbed me strong with the one arm, but guess what I'm going to do? Now I'm going to long arm you. Ooh, Sean Merriman, you know about that long arm. Yeah, it's buddy. strong. Especially when you got them legs underneath and them hips bit. Oh, my God. So now you're pointing in this position. Look at that offensive lineman's feet. There is no power in that position, feet behind each other. Now I'm going to use my outside arm, which is free, because all I'm doing is a long arm. And I'm going to grab one Deshaun Watson. Look at the long arm of the law. And once I pull him down, get him. Hey, bro. Man. Hey, bro, let me check your ID. Get out the club right now. Yeah! <laughs> Deshaun Watson, Man. not 21 Get years of age here. in this club. No drinking for you tonight. <laughs> Man, Miles Garrett, two for one special. All wow. at the quarterback. Miles Garrett, he's our third that dude's dude of the week. Boom. Snap. Mm. Now let's go with number two. Go to my Chargers. Most mm. complete team in Chargers. football right here. L.A. Chargers. Defensive end, Joey Bosa is back. The big Bosa oh, man. Wow. Hit him with that spin. Big Bosa man. The door's open, man. And this is what Joey Bosa does to get the sack on Ben Roethlisberger. First, he's going up the field. Oh, oh, oh Matt Feeler, you're on the island, brother. Enjoy that tiki punch right there because <laughs> Joey Bosa recognizes that he's on the island. So what is he going to do? He's going to attack your outer edge. Yeah, he knows that island's going to get even bigger. As you attack that outer edge, plants that outside foot. Ooh, Dwight Freeney somewhere smiling right now. As this spin move is coming, Ooh. gets that contact point with the fake dent move. And then once you get in this position, Sean Merriman knows this, the most important part is that trail arm. It has Lean to lock up. out the offensive lineman so he can't recover on that play. Put the hand in the dirt, get Roethlisberger. Number two, Joey Bosa. Now let's go to the number one. That dude, dude of the week is Aaron Donald. I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all know who the Donald is. Aaron Donald on this play is going to split the double team. Matt Stafford, give me that. Wow. Oh, ball. Got to go. And Dominican Sue trying to get paid again. Instead <laughs> <laughs> of just falling on it. Possession matters in Dominican. All right, Aaron Donald. Recognizing in the film study right now. Okay, I should get slide protection, but look, 
We got a shade. So in the shade, you know that the center's going to get influenced. He has to punch on Sue. Look at that gap. Oh, it's time to go shopping in that gap right there. Okay, I'm going to bring my bags. Now you can see the arm has the offensive guard pins. But more importantly, look at the head position. It has to be upfield. Once the head position is upfield on the center, there's nothing the center can do. If his head was on the other side, he would be pinned. He's not. Now he uses his leverage and he uses that arm to go and get Matt Stafford pouncing on Matt Stafford like a little grizzly bear going a little hunting for some fish. <laughs> Brings him down to the ground, loss of possession, sack, force fumble, recovery. Aaron Donald, that dude of the week. Great job, Marcellus. That was awesome. Let's yes, move to a big story about Aaron Donald, oh, who is okay. having a monster year to back up the monster contract he got at the start of the year. And now Ram safety John <laughs> Johnson says his teammates should be in the MVP conversation. When you look at the numbers, Johnson may have a point. Donald's taking defensive dominance to a new level, leading the NFL in sacks, QB hits, total pressures, and tackles for loss. At this pace, Donald may break the all-time single-season sack record of 22 and a half held by our guy Michael Strahan. Listen, Aaron Donald's my third MVP candidate of the season. Huh? I started out the year with <laughs> Patrick Mahomes. I was high on Pat, and I'm still high on I'm Patrick Mahomes. Say, you know? Then I jumped to Drew Brees. Drew Brees got took out by the Cowboys. He's still a great candidate. But I'm willing to go right now. I would love to see a defensive player be the MVP. And when you look at what Aaron Donald's doing on an 11 and 1 team, he's the best player on the best team in football, you could argue. Yes. And when you look at the dominance he's having fr from the middle of a defense, leading the league in sacks by like four, uh, I, I think Aaron Donald has a case for MVP, a strong case. I would love to see him win the MVP. Mm. Got to check that Ball State degree right here because <laughs> <laughs> most valuable keyword player. Yeah. Guess what? There's not enough value in the position of defensive tackle to really have this award come home to Aaron Donald. And I'll huh? give you a precedent. I'll give you an example. Who has the sack record? You just said it. Strahan. Strahan, 22 and a half, right? Uh, Strahan in the MVP conversation 2001. Let's just see where he finished because he had to finish high, of course, right? Oh, you know, that was the year that uh, Kurt Warner won it, right? And then right behind him was Marshall Falk. Oh, man, Brett Favre came in third. Ooh, Cordell Stewart fourth. You Damn. know where the Giants Brian finished Erlacher that year? Huh? You know where the Giants finished Seven that and year? 7-9. Thank you. I do my homework. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> okay. so, so here's the point. I already read all five names, and I still ain't got to the sack leader. Not sack leader. Sack record holder. And if you can't... Seven and nine. Okay, I respect all that. But in his same team, there's two other guys trying to share that same MVP conversation. I just go back to the conversation. We have seen someone do this before at the defensive line position at a record level, not even top five in voting. And the quarterback position has gained in value where the defensive tackle position has stayed pat or even decreased. If anything, if he was on the edge, maybe I could hear that. But uh, being on the interior, oh, RPO, no. That, no. That, that's, more of a, that's more nope. of a reason why you give it to him. We're not going to see another player like Aaron Donald for another 10 or 15 years. He is a generational player. And you, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed right now when you... Let's go. I, I am. Because Let's go. Because you know how hard it is to get a sack for one. And you know how hard it is to get a sack in the in, as an interior D lineman. Yes. Aaron Donald now is coming in each and every week, and people know what he can do. Yes. They're game planning him, and they still can't stop him. Right. He is more valuable to me than a guy throwing the ball right now because he's able to get the quarterback back the ball several, you know, multiple times a game in turnovers. I just don't see how you don't pick this guy. If he gets more than 18 sacks, right, if he gets – 18, 19, or somewhere close to 20 sacks, which he probably will at this pace mm -hmm. he's going. Mm -hmm. If he don't win the MVP, it'll be an embarrassment to the NFL with all these offensive-driven calls and rules that the game now has, and mm -hmm. he's still able to go out there and do that. You can't sack him. You can't put your hand over the face mask. You can't touch him below the knee. You can't – all these things, and he's still able to be this dominant – we're, we won't see another Aaron Donald for 10 or 20 years in the National Football League. You've got to give it to him now because this won't happen again. Great. Yeah, Aaron Donald is crazy scary. When you watch him play and watch him move, 
it's like you said, you talking about if if he played defensive end. Mm. Defensive end is easy to get a sack. It's oh, hard to oh, get a it sack. It's easier. He's right. He's right. It's easier. Oh, there is so much more athletic in the, in the, in the interior. It's You're right. So They're not as athletic, well, but the, the, the bodies are so much closer. And talking to, to, to coaches on that Ram staff, mm. they have not seen a guy like Aaron Donald. And walking up on him, he's built like a linebacker, man. That's the crazy part about him. If anybody's I ever... I say a big buff been, fullback, but I hear you. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm saying just yeah. short, stocky, short, yeah, little arm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you don't expect him to be that dominant. I don't think he wins MVP because I think Mahomes will get the 50 touchdowns, which will make it almost impossible not to give it to him. Um, but, man, this, this dude is definitely in the conversation, man. He has to be. He is just so dominant I, of a player. I don't want to say anything negative about Patrick Mahomes because there's very little negative you can say. But the rules have benefited these quarterbacks in such a way Absolutely. that him getting the 50 just isn't as impressive as it was when Brady and Manning first did it. And, I, and, and y'all act like there haven't been rule changes on the interior. And Please I'll say the same to the thing game about... Football. You can't cut block anymore. You can't chop block anymore. It's a safer zone. I'm saying safer. Look, if there's rule changes on the exterior and with the skilled players, there have been rule changes on the interior as well. I just showed you his sack from last week. As much as we call it a double team, it was just nothing but a late slide protection. That wasn't a double yeah, team. Yeah, and, 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 and just think and I'm about not how shots often, Aaron how often they drop like back it. and pass the ball <laughs> now as compared to when compared to when they did it in 2001. But now you're going to make hand. my point. Because no, no, he's that, that's with your you. point. He's I'm agreeing, agreeing with you right, to, right. to the standpoint of he's getting a lot more opportunities than Michael Strahan ever dreamed of. When I came in this league in 2004, it was 22 personnel, which is two, two tight ends, two running backs, or two tight ends and one running back. Right. Nowadays, they aren't. They don't even exist. You know, if if, if an offense isn't no an eleven personnel, to clean up a defense yeah, lineup. yeah. If, if if an offense isn't an eleven personnel, they live in that as far as their base. And so Aaron is getting a lot more opportunities and to no rush back the in passer. the backfield. No fullback coming through yeah. there. He's a lot more oh, opportunities man. to rush the passer. But still, what he's doing is impressive. And the way he's doing it, don't just look at the numbers. Watch this man work. I'm with you, and, big dog. And, and you will have respect for what he does. And you need to have respect for defensive ends because to me, you're saying it's easy to get a sack as a DN. It's easy to get an interception as a safety over we, here. We, we, both, we both played for Wade Phillips, and we know that scheme is built for the outside linebackers that go in there and the DNs to go get make big plays. What he's doing right now as an interior lineman will never happen again. It won't happen for the next Stop 10 that. or 20 years. Stop I'm telling that. you, it won't People happen. always say that. It Stop. won't happen. When's the last time it happened where, where an interior lineman gets 20 sacks? Let me look in my it's list. Never it's, happened. it's never happened. No, no, 20, but he ain't got 20 either. But he'll but get it, 20. He's, yeah, he's going to get it. I mean, yeah. he's it ain't get, never happened. He'll Listen, get the, the last time we saw defensive line play this dominant Go ahead, was Warren Sapp in Tampa in his heyday. And this is at a different level than Warren Sapp. And, and, and in a league you. where you have to – the only way to win is to create third and longs mm. or second and 13s. And it's not just the sacks. He's leading the league in tackles for loss as well. He's creating these opportunities to get your defense off the field, which is very hard in this league right now. I think it's just as valuable as anything we're seeing from the uh, quarterback position – uh, because he, there's a lot of guys throwing for 5,000 yards this year. There's a lot of guys with high touchdown, low interception ratio. There's only one guy mm -hmm. that's dominating the line of scrimmage the way that he is. Uh, J.J. Watt, I would throw in there. But J.J. Two Watt, 20 plus JJ sacks Watt but uh, yeah, but J.J. Watt has five less sacks this year than Aaron Donald. It, 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 to me, Off the edge. one of these two guys – Donald, J.J. Watt need to be in there. And Donald, to me, has a slight lead now over J.J. Watt. Aaron Donald deserves the MVP. Your Honor, if I may say one more word on my behalf, right? <laughs> Are y'all kidding me? Um, this defensive line position, if we're going to group it all together, we have seen sack artists after sack artists, and only two in history have ever been named the MVP. Y'all go back, Alan Page in the 70s, yep. Purple People Eaters, and LT, who changed the position. We're rooting for Aaron Donald, but I'm just keeping it real up here, earning my check. He is not going to win the MVP discussion because they're going to give it to the most valuable position, which is a quarterback. Again, a shame. You, most valuable position. Mm -hmm. And just because they're wrong <laughs> doesn't mean we're not right. Mm, and I, so, again, <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like we're right. You're they right. can do the wrong thing and give it to somebody else, yeah. but we're on the right side of this. It should be Aaron Donald. Whitlock and Wiley, we're joined now by NBA analyst Jim Jackson and Kenyon Martin. 
Let's move to Los Angeles, where the LeBron James era is off to an up and down start with LeBron and the Lakers young core still trying to figure things out. Before the season, it became clear other big stars weren't anxious to join James in L.A. with Paul George deciding to stay in OKC. Jimmy Butler leaving the Lakers off his list of trade destinations and Kawhi Leonard expressing more interest in the Clippers than yeah. the Lakers. Yeah. Now <laughs> Kevin Durant says he understands why, telling Rick Buecher, quote, like young players that are still developing, it's always going to be hard because he demands the ball so much, he demands control of the offense, and he creates for everybody. So much hype comes from being around LeBron from other people. He has so many fanboys in the media so I get why anyone wouldn't want to be in that environment because it's toxic. It's not LeBron's fault at all. Hmm. Very interesting story in Bleacher Report by Rick Buecher and very fascinating comments by uh, Kevin Durant that I kind of agree with. I, I think it's going to be very difficult to impossible to get particularly another wing player to yeah. come and play with LeBron James. I read the story and I was like, Anthony Davis is the only real option mm. for LeBron in, in, in L.A. Uh, I think Kevin Durant has made some sound points and Rick Buecher. Very tough for them to get a superstar to play with LeBron. Yeah, I'm going to keep this short. Just a high altitude. Um, looking at LeBron, I don't think the narrative was ever out there that he was a destination for superstars because we never seen it happen. We saw him join some. We saw him come at the same time with a Chris Bosh, but never landing one place and then a superstar joined LeBron's team. It's never happened. Two, um, the narrative is out there that if you win, it's because of LeBron. If you lose, it's because of y'all. Y'all the problem. Y'all hold LeBron back. And I think this situation is a gift and a curse. The Lakers have shown loyalty to a fault. They gave Kobe two years 50 when they knew he was done. That sounds good if you're Kobe. That sounds good if you're the Lakers in terms of the economics and entertainment value. But it mm -hmm. sounds horrible to everybody else because they like, you're going to ride that till the wheels fall off. So what superstar is going to be there where they're still going to appreciate LeBron even if he starts to descend and not give that other superstar his proper credit? I think they have, yeah, it's, it's tough because the, the demand, like you said, that, that LeBron puts on you on the court and off the court, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying, to be in that same environment. But, like, people's egos get in the way. If you're a superstar and you did, like, why not just come to a situation and want to win? Like, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with joining this man? What if you lose, though? Tucking, he's not losing. LeBron has. He, he's made yeah. it to the finals every year. Mm -hmm. He great. makes everybody around him better. So if you got to make so their who, reputation better. Who cares about your reputation? Who, who Ooh, cares? Wait a oh, minute. Everybody Kenyon. cares. Uh oh. Who what, cares what, about it? Yeah. What we Chris here to do? Chris Bosh cares. Oh, we do, Kevin listen, Love. We should be here to win basketball. Ky games. Kyrie. They sensitive. Y'all know the way I say. Listen, when it comes to me in sports, I've been saying this: put your feelings in your pocket, man. <laughs> your feelings don't matter. What? We here to win basketball games. Wins and losses will ultimately what you're going to be judged on. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's, but here's why superstar. <laughs> everything he said in that was true in regards to big time superstars, because especially the younger guys. Because Paul George feels like he's a number one. Yeah. Kawhi Leonard, quietly, even though he doesn't talk about it, number one. I agree with you on Anthony Davis. He's on. The, he's he's not a perimeter player, so he don't have to worry about it as much. So guys do in today's world. They look at it as I'm a number one. I can carry. I don't need to go play with LeBron now. A guy like me later in my career, oh, definitely, I'm playing with LeBron. You oh, know right. why? Because yeah. I'm getting buckets. I'm going to get to be able, one, to win, first of all. Mm -hmm. And two, I'm going to be in a situation we playing on TV all the time. We're going to championships. I get it. So I get it from both sides of the equation. From one, I, just, I just don't understand why Kevin Durant, it doesn't put him in a good light optically when he says it like that, just because of everything else that goes on. It makes it seem like he's hating again, even though he's telling the truth. Oh, definitely you took it that way. No, no, no. It's no, no, because, because no, it's just the truth, but every time you hear something coming from Kevin Durant, you look, at mm -hmm. it, look at it as a negative. I know he's telling the truth, Yeah. but optically, a lot of people look at it like, oh, it's KD again, yeah, it's talking about somebody else, he's shading something else. Yeah, it's through shady lenses when it's coming from him. Exactly. Who because was he throwing shade at, though? When he was just I, talking about the right. And they, the fan they, looking boys. As, they looking at it, he's throwing shade towards LeBron. Now. Yeah, e even though he put that little clip in there, it's not his fault. Yeah, but, but when you put that butt in there, you like, can't forget all the other stuff. Did you take it as shade? LeBron? I just heard I that, 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 that this is not his fault statement. I heard the whole statement other than I never heard 
I that thought it was a fault. candid response from KD who was just telling you, look, I'm number two in the world. Let me just tell you the, the difference between playing with number one and but being here's me. the difference. Again, to me, I know he's telling the truth. I don't look at it like that. But all the KD haters out there, the people that talk about KD is sensitive, this is another thing they'll use in regards to his sensitivity when he's saying something. That's all I'm saying. But I'm not it, saying that's not it's true. Interesting, but look, look, LeBron, th there's no better case in point than LeBron playing with Kyrie Irving, and Kyrie finally said, I have to go somewhere and light the torch instead of carrying it with you. When they were in Game 7 in the finals, and LeBron gets the block, but then Kyrie goes out there and wins the series in one shot, a, a massive dagger from the three-point line, and to this point, every highlight, every time you look, they show LeBron's block. They show a block over a three-point dagger. That, to me, says it all about playing with LeBron. No matter what you do, it will be superseded I, by him. I, I agree with you there, but my example is Dwayne Wade. D Dwayne Wade, to me, is one of the all-time greatest players. To me, he's probably in my top 25. He's not regarded that way, I don't think, because he played with LeBron. Those two championships with LeBron didn't enhance Dwayne Wade's legacy. Say it. Dwayne Wade, to me, is right there a cut below Kobe. I, I, I'm not going to disrespect Kobe's five titles, but he's not considered that way. He's, he's considered as an afterthought to LeBron. But, but, but is Dwayne a transformational type player? Was he viewed that way before LeBron? No. So you're not going to get the same... He uh, came to a team, uh, but, to a but, title, okay, put Shaq okay, big okay, ass on okay. his back. So, so did Larry Bird. <laughs> so did Larry Bird. Larry Bird carried teams to title, but transformational is only so many guys that stand out. Tom Brady oh, is. Oh, like, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Tom I, Brady is like that, right? I'm, I'm, I'm offended. Oh, oh wait. Are you trying to say Larry Bird wasn't a transformational I, I said, player? I'm, he's not. He's not in the same regard as a LeBron James or Magic Johnson. Uh, and, and Michael Jordan. Oh. Michael Jordan. He, no, no. He's not looked Ooh. upon that. You in Kenya no, no. today, man. I'm just Listen, telling you. Hit him, baby. Hit him with it. 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 When you got Dominique, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, well, hold here, on, wait, man. and they walk in the room. They in the room. Walk, they in the room. You got the energy in there. Michael Jordan walk in there, the energy totally changed. It's a total different thing when Michael Jordan comes in the room compared to everybody else. Yeah, okay. He's not the only hold one. Up, hold, 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 this is what I'm saying. But it's only a few that have that kind of. And aura. Larry Bird wasn't. No, one? not to Woo! me. No. You've overtaken this show. That's that's one of the hottest takes I've yeah. ever been at offered. It's, on it's this a show. totally different. It's a different. It's a di you agree with that? It's a different. It's a different feeling. I'm telling. Larry was a bad man. Listen, he was taking a bad nothing man. away from what Larry did. Nothing. You're not taking anything away from what he did for the game of basketball. You can't put him on the same level. But transformative as Michael Jordan. Of, I'm with oh, you. Man, bro. listen. I, I'm and, with you. And, and I know both y'all. So don't be. I'm not even remotely trying to put y'all in a bad light. I'm just legitimately trying to understand. Is and I'm trust me, I'm okay. saying this mm. authentically and not trying to put you in the back. But is any of this like black players oh, don't respect Larry Bird? Not, I, love, I love Larry Bird. I love Larry Bird. I love Larry Bird. Listen, I, I've never heard anybody not put Larry in yeah. the same breath as Magic, Michael. I said transformational. And, Are we filming do the right I said, thing? I didn't say play why. Is it do the it, right it, thing is, too? Is Larry Bird in your top five? Yeah, because listen, no. man. Without you your top five? With, with, top five. without without top ten, without yeah. Larry, Magic's not what Magic is. How you know that? You're not how you're young. I, no, you're, no, I grew up watching the Lakers and, and Bird Magic and, play. and Larry, but man. That they, doesn't, they, but they, that doesn't mean his, that doesn't mean he's transformational as as much so as the whole league. Five? They transformed the I, whole I league. I understand that, but I'm telling you, is Kobe you, top five? Kobe Bryant's yeah, not did. top five. No, they, so they why? did. But you say, well, but is he, he transformational? Who's together? Yes. Kobe's not transformational either? Oh, I don't understand. Look, no, it's only so many. <laughs> to me, tra my, my transformation, though, is totally different oh, than I, everybody I, else. And I'm entitled to my opinion. I learned that. that. Yeah, it's but totally different. We got to go. I, I can't. We were we, we talking can just, about we can LeBron. Just, we can continue it. <laughs> it's a whole different aura when you. Larry Bird, no, no. Man. It's a whole different aura between and Michael I'm a Jordan. Magic Johnson fan. You know, I live in Indiana. Whole different and story. Rooted for whole, Magic Johnson. You can say it all you want. It's a whole different aura when Magic walks in, when Michael walks in, and when LeBron walks in. The aura is totally different than when the Larry Bird you, walks in. You need in. to come to Indiana yeah. then. For what? And I, have Larry Bird. Okay, that's Indiana. 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 Great. Indiana State, oh. Indiana State to the national champ. Great. Oh. That's all that is. We're like, go to commercial. They're yeah, going to YouTube please. us for this. <laughs>
All right, it's time for Thinking Cap. No caps today because we're going to stick on a very serious subject. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley. D'Angelo Hall and Jim Jackson are back with us. Let's return to the NFL and the discussion about the fallout over the Kareem Hunt assault video. Yesterday on this show, we invited Christine Leahy and a domestic violence expert to discuss whether the NFL should allow Hunt back into the league. Marcella Rios Faust, the CEO of Human Options, says Hunt has some work to do. He needs to really work to restore his reputation and show and demonstrate that his behavior is changing. When you see multiple incidents, there's something underlying that needs to be addressed. All right, much of the discussion revolving around Hunt and, the Re and Redskins linebacker Ruben Foster focuses on punishment. <clears throat> this is what we do every time an athlete is involved in one of these situations. Today, I'd like to explore what the NFL, sports, and men can do in general to curtail violence against women. I think there's an opportunity for athletes and men to redefine masculinity in a way that moves the culture in a positive direction. And Marcellus, I wanted to circle back to this conversation because you and I yesterday got in a little bit of a debate about I, my contention is I think men have become too emotional. Mm. Uh, and, and you pushed back and said there's a difference between emotion and sensitivity. I, I, I really loved your point, but I stand on what I think is a problem for us as men, and I'm going to even narrow it down for us. I think it's a problem for us as black men. We are allowing our emotions to take us places where they just shouldn't take us. Someone calls us a name, and we think we have to have an emotional response. We get so caught up in, can't nobody disrespect me, can't nobody disrespect me, that I always have to do something in response. And I think it's incumbent upon us as men to have this conversation. I think it's incumbent upon us as men. You three guys are all fathers, <coughs> raising boys and things. I wanted to have that conversation with you all. Yeah, um, look, uh, I, if I have to get to the core of the issue uh, in terms of masculinity and this definition, <clears throat> and, in, and in our neighborhood, and obviously our likeness being black males, I think the definition is improper. I, I think it's limited. I think that we all know as a black man that our expressions at times are limited, uh, case in point. Um, if you're growing up as a black man and you're trying to prioritize your education to a degree where, well, for me, um, it wasn't in balance with my ac uh, athletic pursuits, people were like, hey, bro. Um, and I heard names called towards me just because I was in pursuit of something different than the average Joe in my community. Limited expression suppresses uh, your anger and, and you don't have an opportunity to let go. As a father, I'm gonna have a conversation with my son says you're equal to your white counterparts. Except in certain situations, if you get pulled over, you're not equal to your white counterparts. That's gonna be a separate conversation. I'm gonna tell them that your women are equal to you. Except in physical altercation, uh, they are weaker as a gender compared to men in terms of physicality. So we're not gonna go there in equal, uh, uh, there's inequity in equality. Being here now, what you see from these NFL players is it, it, so tough because we grow up thinking that being tough, being hard, being cool is being a man. When in reality, I, I use the Eastern philosophy, which is true strength is shown in weakness, walking away, yeah. letting somebody call yeah. you out your yeah. name and just Absolutely. stepping on like, bro, I got bigger fish to fry than the words that came out of somebody's mouth that I don't even know. So I think it starts there where our community has defined what toughness and masculinity looks like when I think it's improper. Yeah, yeah, I think we all, we all, grew up a certain way. I grew up in, 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 in the 757 area, and it's by no means Compton or some of the worst streets out in the world, but it is a rough place. And I was taught, without, you know, I grew up without a dad, and I was taught being strong was to not take nothing from anybody, to defend yourself, to, uh, you know, to be a man, you know, mm -hmm. not cry. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I have a 16-year-old son who's a sophomore in high school. And I try to let him know. I try to let him see me when I'm vulnerable. Because I want him to know, like, look, saying you're sorry when you really, when it's probably not your fault, but just knowing that it can, it, it can help better a situation is a good thing. Crying because X, Y, Z happened is a good thing. I had a brother that was killed when I was 12 years old. You know, I didn't cry till I was probably 30, mm -hmm. 31. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that was something I had to get through to him. And I try to get through to all my, all my kids, but especially my boys that... It's okay as a man to show signs of weakness because 
in showing those signs of weaknesses and showing those signs of, of not being strong, it's, it is being strong. Asking for help when you don't have the answers is a sign of strength. And so I always constantly try to teach my boys that. And it's an ongoing struggle because society doesn't want them to do that. Right. Society wants you to feel like, oh, she said X, Y, Z to you, you got to say something back. No, you don't. You have to walk away because you have sisters, is what I tell my son, and you don't want any, like, what, what would you do if somebody put talked to your sister like that? Yeah. Or if someone put their hands on your sister? So always, always think about that and put yourself in that situation. And I wasn't taught that. I had to learn that. And I was labeled a knucklehead. I by no means did some of the stuff that other guys are accused of. But I was a, I was a bad apple. Like, I needed guidance. I needed these 14 years to grow in the National Football League because it, it turned me into the man I am now. And people always ask, would you change anything? There's a lot of things that I would probably change, but I can't say that I want to change them because I would not be the person that I am right now right. having not gone through some of those things. And, and on your point about the emotion ego <laughs> thing, I think that's a – really good dynamic to look at because a lot of times when, <clears throat> when we as men get upset, our ego gets attacked. Mm -hmm. So we got to protect our ego or he disrespected me. I told my son when he was younger, he was probably in the 10th grade, I said, listen, man, how many friends you got? He, he said, name and off. I said, no, you don't. I said, it's going to be three reasons why a guy's not going to like you, okay? One, you're making more money than him. Two, you get more pressed than him. Three, the woman, the girl, likes you and don't like him. That's all ego. Mm. So now... When a guy feels like he's disrespected, whether it's a male or female, they got to puff up their chest because of how they were raised, okay? What I try to do with my son now, and I think all of us now growing up a little bit differently, especially in professional sports, we're trying to teach our, our sons to get away from that ego side, to be able to, one, be able to communicate a lot better. Because if you communicate with a woman when you're young, you'll be able to communicate with her when you're older. And now you'll be able to walk away from a situation and you won't see her just as an object. Because a lot of times when you have domestic violence, you see that person as an object and you react accordingly because you don't see them as a feminine person, mm -hmm. okay? Because your ego got attacked. So I think a lot of times the communication when we're younger to respecting that person, which is that woman, being taught that when you're younger is so important. When we were growing up, again, my father was a bus driver. He taught me things a lot different. He worked nine to five, nine to six, nine, whatever it was, okay? You gotta get a job. In order to be a man, you gotta have calluses on your finger. Mm -hmm. You can't cry. You can't do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But now I think us, this generation is trying to be a little bit different and tapping into that sensitive side a little bit more, but trying to get away from the ego that drives us to do some, some of the things that we see. And two, it's about them seeing things that they normally, that, that, that we didn't see growing up. Like I said, I grew up, my mom, I was the youngest of six, single, single parents. She was a school teacher, worked two, three jobs sometimes just to make sure we had enough. And so I didn't know what it was like to be a dad. And I constantly <laughs> apologize to my oldest son because I'm like, son, I'm sorry. Because I, like, he sees me with our seven-year-old twins and he's like, Dad, you know, you, you, you were playing, you playing basketball with them, you do this, you do that. Like, I was playing by myself. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, because I was so busy worried about trying to be a great football player. I wasn't necessarily trying to be a great father or a great husband. And so I try to let him know, yes, I was wrong. I was learning as well. And you were kind of my <laughs> guinea pig. And so, yes, I'm going to be a better dad to them because I had to learn. And a lot of us, where we come from, we don't have dads. We don't have... The picture of what it's supposed to really look like. Talk and, about it, y'all. And, and, and that's not a that's not a a, a a cop out by any means. No, it's a fact. But it's, it's a, a fact. fact. It's a true fact. You, you guys have just told the exact crux of the issue, contradicting messages. Mm -hmm. You talk about ego. What is ego? It is your self value, your self esteem. What are we taught as we're young men becoming men? to go out there and show your worth to the world, to obtain worth, obtain value, so that you can provide for the family and protect for that family. So think about it. What you're trying to protect is what you're trying to earn, but you don't even have it yet. So now you go out there with these mindsets and these notions of what masculinity looks like. And think about this. When you talk about your self-worth and you're a man and it's so wrapped up in what other people can see in you instead of what you are in yourself. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a very tough neighborhood. Everyone knows Compton South Central, the reputation precedes it. I saw what toughness looked like. When I saw my uncles and family members who were real gangsters and killers and robbers come in the house and cry, I knew how 
toughness was a facade. Mm -hmm. It was because you had limited opportunity in your mind mm -hmm. to affect the world. So what happens? You start to affect your neighborhood. You start to affect your block. You start to affect the dude that walked by you. You start to affect the stranger who touched your shoe. You go so far mm -hmm. to trying to show how bad you are. And when you come to this mindset of perception that I'm not having this impact on the world, you bring it closer and closer to the point where you have all this suppressed anger because you don't feel like you have value. I would like to, and we don't have a lot of time, but we have enough. Right. Marcellus, what you're talking about, and I think what D'Angelo's talking about being from Virginia, is that I, I think a lot of times, and I don't know Kareem Hunt's background, I've read a little bit about Reuben mm. Foster's background, and it was very tough. Mm. And sometimes, just to survive in the neighborhood, say that. you have to be very intimidating. Yeah. You have, to. You, you have, you to, have be, to. to ward off everything that might be trying to prey on you. You have to be very intimidating. And then you step out and you get rewarded on the football field or basketball court for, for being, being intimidating. Or, or even in life. Or even for being intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just talking about the athletes. Yeah. Yeah. You got a tough, intimidating to survive your neighborhood, intimidating and survive on the football field, and you, I think as coaches, as men, as former athletes, we need to start spreading the word through athletics. Intimidation is great on the field and on the court. Let's take, let's tone it down off the court. Because when you walk around trying to be intimidating, uh -huh. trust me, there's somebody else that, oh, okay, I can be just as intimidating. And that's why the sparks fly between us as men and that's why the sparks go get way out of control whenever a woman challenges us mm -hmm. and it leads to a, a fire that burns our, us up, burns the victim up. We have to tone down the intimidation thing. Let's quit trying to be intimidating to each other. Save that for the football field where it's appropriate, on the basketball right. where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But off the court... I don't want to be intimidated. It's the switch that they always talk about. And Jason, I decoded that message when I was like nine years old, when I had them gangsters running to my house crying. But at the same time, I heard everyone outside in fear of those same people. And I learned, that's why I'm not a fighter. People know me. I, I'm happy. I, you call me something to my name, out my name? Good with Bye. It. Like, yeah. you, what up, punk? Hey, bro, you good? <laughs> like, you know why? Because I saw the end game of being tough. Yeah. And here's the thing about it that I want everyone to understand about that toughness. From someone from a real tough situation, I'm trying to escape that. So whenever I see someone validating that through their behavior mm -hmm. and really poking out and doing that, I see through that because that is just pain being expressed. Mm -hmm. That's You didn't get enough hugs, brother. Yeah. You don't yeah. have the family structure you need. You yeah. don't have the right dynamics in your life. You are not fooling me when you walk around here, especially of age and still trying to act hard. Every single tough kid and adult I've met, you sit down and talk to them thoroughly and long enough, you're going to see those tears start to fall. Well, as a father, one thing I did with my son that I didn't get from my father, I love you. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love you. At any chance I could get, because my son had to figure out his own little way, mm -hmm. okay, and he had to live up to being my son. So he had to fight that battle himself. But I made it a point to hug him, kiss him, tell him I love him, to kind of break the cycle. My yeah. father didn't know. He grew up totally different. Yeah. And by doing that, my son now, when he was going through his little stuff about to get engaged, he knew how to approach it. I said, the thing you got to do with a woman, you got to listen. Open your ears, because she's going to tell you what she's expecting. Anything ever jump off, you walk away from the situation, gather your thoughts, and you get, go back and talk. That's what I've learned as I've grown more than anything else, and that's what I'm trying to teach myself. All right, welcome back. Whitlock and Wiley, D'Angelo Hall and Sean Merriman are back. Let's move to Pittsburgh, where the Steelers are looking for answers after a couple of bad losses in a row. Pittsburgh's pass-happy offense blew a big lead over the Chargers on Sunday night, prompting some in the media to say that they need more a more balanced attack a criticism Big Ben doesn't seem to appreciate very much. I don't think that there's any reason for people to get worked up over the number of runs compared to passes. People are always going to get worked up over the numbers when you lose, especially. I don't I don't know if people would get as worked up if we would have won the game. So, you know, that's why Randy's the OC and calls the plays for us. And I think we're all just fine with the run-pass ratio. We just want to win. Well, the Steelers are throwing at the highest rate in team history by a large margin. And as you can see, none of their other top passing seasons – have ended with a Super Bowl. Look, I, I keep saying all week, I love Big Ben, but Big Ben's the problem. Hmm. Big Ben installed his buddy as the offensive coordinator. Big Ben thought 
he was going to put together an MVP season this year. Big Ben thinks, you know, Tom Brady, a 41 MVP. Now it's going to be my turn. I'm going to throw for all these yards and all these, and we're going to have this success, and I'm going to put myself in the same conversation with the other all-time great quarterbacks, and it's blown up in his face, and that's why he's defending it. It's quite obvious they're out of balance here, and that's why they're <laughs> underachieving a tad bit. Um, you can say that, that all that happened, and Ben is now – uh, out there trying to defend his name and his game. Or you could say that he's actually right. And if you look at the numbers uh, in terms of the balance between run-pass ratio, only one team in the NFL runs the ball more than they pass the football. And that is, da -da -da -da, we all know, Seattle Seahawks. That's the only team. Um, everyone else is like, excuse me, Dougie Fresh. Uh, I am going to throw this ball more than I'm going to run this ball. You know why? It's the same thing that happened in the NBA. The analytics came in, all these MIT cats. They're doing it too much. Columbia. And They're they, doing it too much. I'm just telling you this. I drink green smoothies, Marcellus. Doesn't look like But it. I drink them three at a time. <laughs> 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 That's, That's a, the problem. Everybody's drinking smoothies, but I'm drinking three at a time. Boy, every, That's a problem. Yeah. Every break. <laughs> every break. Look. That's the problem. Look. Play value. Oh, let me just finish. All right. Play value. It's the same thing that happened in the NBA in terms of shot value. That's why everyone shoots threes. It's just an arithmetic equation. It's the same thing in the NFL. Play value shows that you need to throw the ball heavily and more so than you do run the football. It's just a simple equation. I understand that, but it doesn't mean Ben should be throwing the ball more than 40 times a game. Okay. I mean, the numbers are the numbers, and he's throwing the ball a whole lot. A whole lot. Of and I, and, and, and it's, it's a very crazy correlation that his – quarterback coach who he used to go in that room and vent to about wish I could throw it a lot more and you know what else mm -hmm. he doesn't have Le'Veon oh Bell back yeah there I was screaming at him it. hey I want to run the ball does he he has James Conner who's just gonna go back there Little play pony. his role yeah, play his role <laughs> and do what they tell him to do you ain't lying. and so Ben's not being held accountable for throwing the ball or ha or wanting to throw the ball as much as he does. Now, yes, the National Football League is a passing league now, absolutely. But the numbers don't lie. When Ben relies on this run game and he can throw it less than 40 times, they just got a better chance to win. Mm -hmm. when, when, I, when, I see, when I hear Ben Roethlisberger talk, I hear him getting upset and, because I know the media is leading him to Le'Veon Bell, and he don't want to answer that. I don't care how much the NFL has converted into a passing football league. It doesn't matter. When you got a running back who can hurt you at any point in time in the backfield, the defense has respect. You can be throwing the ball all day, but you're going to respect what's in the backfield. James Conner ain't respected. And mm. you know, I'm watching the game, the Chargers game. I'm, you know, we, I'm rooting for my boys. I'm you know, Bill, Bill O'Homer. I'm hope, hoping that they came out with a big win. They I'm did. I'm with you. But I don't think that game would have turned out as it did if they had Le'Veon Bell in the backfield. You know why? Because they got nobody back there that's respected. And they're trying to do everything at this point to stay away from talking about him. Because that's the next one. If they have another loss, Ben Roethlisberger, there, someone in that organization is going to have to admit that they made a mistake and mm. not finding a way to bring Le'Veon Bell back in. Message. And even more so than, than Le'Veon being respected, is Le'Veon knowing I'm getting my touches. Period. Right. Because they pay who, me. Because they pay me to get my touches. <laughs> They're not going to pay Le'Veon $14 million and let Ben throw the ball 60 times a game. Not going to happen. And so, hey, Le'Veon's not back there complaining about getting the ball. All right, let's run. Let, let, let's throw this oh, thing. Yeah. Exactly like you said. I'm going to put me an MVP season together. I got my boy as the OC. Come on, Randy. Let's get this let's thing Let's go done. get that money. Let's get it. I got you a job. Shoot, look out for me. <laughs> the funny thing is nothing happens by accident in the NFL. Merriman, we had this discussion before. When you are Sean Merriman, yeah, 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 all that, ain't no rotating Sean Merriman in and out, right? But then when you get to Buffalo or I get to Dallas or something, hey, Wiley, a couple of these third downs, let's get this other guy oh, in. Oh, yeah, there. been there. And you're like, what does that mean? Nothing happens by accident. Upstairs, they have made the calculation. Mm -hmm. James Conner, uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, last four games, 65 yards has been the most. We've given them some touches, 15, and we're not seeing it. So that's what starts to happen. You have to shift the other way to the pass again. All right, thank you, D'Angelo. Thank you, Sean. Time to get anti-social. Got get my em. Twitter off. Get him. Got our social media manager, Darnell Smith, here with a big smile and a worn central Always. representative. Jersey.
pullover on. All right. Uh huh. The Wiener Snitzel. Oh. <laughs> that's the big W. State champ. Baby. State champ. Yeah. Whatever state you want to call us, put state champs first. No. Big hey. Ball State hoops game tonight. By the way, we play Loyola Chicago and Sister Jean. Oh, uh, Ball yeah. State. We play Sister Jean tonight. You can't go to that game after what you said about. Sister Jean. <laughs> no, I cannot. Neither Damn. one of y'all can go. <laughs> right, that was popping out there in Twitter land. Yeah. Let's start with Kevin Durant, mm. who's from Washington D.C. Mm. We know he's a big time Redskins fan. And lots of Redskins fans have been pushing for this team to sign Colin Kaepernick. Mm. Durant joined the party yesterday, posting his IG of Kaepernick from his Nike Believe in Something ad campaign and tagging the team. So, guys, I mean, it's one thing when Twitter eggs pump up Kaepernick, but KD's le a legit superstar. Yeah. Do you guys like KD showing the support here? I don't. Why not? It's full Twitter. It's Why? just Twitter. It's enti he's entitled to his opinion, and he he's a fan, and he's from there. What? Again, he's what? entitled to his opinion. Yeah. All he's trying to do here, and that's all Kaepernick is right now, what? is a way for people to get retweets and likes and build their Twitter following. It's not based in reality. The man hasn't played football in two years. It's just Twitter stuff. And that's no. what, we're only talking Kaepernick in the Twitter segment from no. here on out. Because no. <laughs> that's all he is. He's just a figment of Twitter's imagination. Nah, I think Cap could get into thinking Cap somehow. We can no. get into that. <laughs> but here's the thing. He is not good enough, I'm going to say this again, yeah. to be Mark Sanchez's backup. I understand your stance. Look, you have some points. I understand. Look, there's the other side of the table. Doesn't want to deal with the noise. Yeah. But damn, <laughs> Sanchez's backup? It's he the can't ice be that guy? bucket challenge. That's no. all this <laughs> oh, Remember what yeah. ice bucket challenge, the I slam did. dunk? I That's did. all this is these people do now. I love they tweet KD out doing Kaepernick this. stuff. It's the challenge. I love KD Look. doing this. He's making a great point that everyone recognizes. And it, it made Jay Gruden go up there and lie. Oh, you know what? A quarterback that runs the ball is the easiest dude to have at quarterback. Guess what? Just run the ball, damn it. And right. if you see somebody overthrow it. Quarterback that doesn't prepare during the week is not the easiest. 16 touchdowns to four interceptions, Jason yeah. Whitlock. What has Sanchez and, and done lately? Mm. Higher quarterback rating than even Alex Smith is Colin Kaepernick. I'm dropping these jewels. Move on, Darnell. <laughs> Drop the Darnell, mic. Go ahead. these jewels. <laughs> All right, man. Let's move on to the Green Bay Packers. I'm on Twitter, Nick. <laughs> what I'm calling it from here on out. Wrong. Oh, man. Move on to the Green Bay Packers, where interim head coach Joe Philbin is already making his presence felt, firing assistant Winston Moss after he called out Aaron Rodgers and put the Packers' coaching search on blast. Mm. Check out this tweet. Ponder this. What championship teams have are great leadership, <clears throat> period. It's not the office of guru trim. It's not the safe trim. Find somebody that's going to hold number 12 and everybody in this building to a Lombardi standard, period. Hashtag losing sucks. Moss followed up a few hours later. The Packers have informed me that they're letting me go. Hashtag thanks Twitter. <laughs> so Philbin said, I mean, there's obviously other reasons <laughs> that <laughs> Packers are still firing, but this played a big part. Y'all have any issue with Moss getting fired over a tweet? Hell no. First of all, they usually fire staff, so that, that, that day was coming more than likely anyway. Yeah. But you cannot be in the business world, in big business, and, and as soon as they fire a coach, in part because of his relationship with number 12, tweet out something about number 12. Like, just read the tea leaves, brother. That was crazy. This is a clear indication of Winston. I love you to death, but <laughs> got to give you this Twitter off. This is just bad business. Bad man. business. Bad bi First of all, what he's basically saying is, I should be the interim head coach. Mm. I'm a leader. Mm. We don't need an offensive guy, a guru, blah, blah, blah. We need a leader. <laughs> I'm going to hold Aaron accountable. He's in the unemployment line. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so if Aaron gets traded, maybe you can lead him somewhere. Yeah. You gone, yeah. man. That, that's that's like me tweeting out something about Marcellus and Whitlock today and expecting me to just come on inside social tomorrow. You know what I mean? <laughs> that is true, Darnell. Yeah, yeah. Don't, Calm don't down, make that Right. <laughs> you, you speaking into an existence. Calm down, dog. You're going to start don't going there. Uh-uh. <laughs> All right, next. I got a funny LeBron tweet for y'all. Okay. Check this out from this morning. What do you do? Man, I'm washed. I went to bed at 8.30 last night and woke up at 7.30 a.m. Man, what? I literally slept for 11 hours. Missed my company Christmas holiday party and everything. All right, y'all. Uh, I... I don't really believe this, honestly. I mean, this is a good excuse. Y'all buying this? Nope. <laughs> now, this is definite smoke screen. Passive yeah. aggressive LeBron. You covering up tracks and everything. Yeah. <laughs> you was MIA. Yeah. Where you, LeBron at? Where LeBron at? I was asleep. The, oh. the company <laughs> Christmas party, one, why tweet it? Two, yeah. you know why you're tweeting it, because you're trying to take them shots under the mm -hmm. radar, but now everyone sees them passive aggressively. Three, 
I don't believe anybody who talks to me in round numbers. Like, if you, if I give you some money, you come back with my change, and it's a perfect round number, I'm like, dog, where the rest of my money at? <laughs> Ain't no exact 7, 30, 8, 30. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, you lying. Right. Bro, you ain't sleep no 11 hours Unless perfectly. Unless your alarm was set. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's still your fault. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, if I saw an 8.37 in there, then a 7.26, <laughs> I'd be like, all right, LeBron, but he over there at 8.30, 7.30. Stop lying. Bad smoke screen here. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say about it. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. He didn't all right, last, yeah, last, <laughs> last but not least. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah, first things first this morning. Uh, my guy, Cece, has some inside information on the coaching gig. Uh, take a listen. I'm just going to tell you guys a name. Watch out for Jim Harbaugh. Because Jim Harbaugh potentially is trying to get his way out of Michigan. All right? I got good sources that are telling me not only Green Bay, but also watch out for the Cleveland Browns. Mm. Mm. Would y'all rather see Harbaugh coach Baker Mayfield or Aaron Rodgers? I'd rather, ooh, Harbaugh. It'd be, it'd be better with Baker. Uh, I just don't see him and Aaron Rodgers. That's oil and water right there. At least Baker's <laughs> young, and he has to take some of that. Jim Harbaugh is a guy that I think Aaron Rodgers would listen to. I, 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 mm. I, I, I do. His, his, his offensive resume doesn't speak grand enough. Even He helped Colin Kaepernick become who yeah. he was. That's more of the Baker Mayfield mode than going there. Aaron Rodgers thinks he knows it all, which he probably does, but then I don't think he's going to defer enough. Mm. I, I, can, I used to work in Ann Arbor. I'm, I love Michigan. I, I think Michigan fans are probably upset. An Ohio State legend is talking about Jim Harbaugh leaving Michigan and going to Ohio, uh, going to the NFL. Uh, CC sources are pretty damn strong, though. Yeah. So I think there's probably some truth to this that maybe Jim Harbaugh does want to get back to the I NFL. think the loss to Ohio State was a backbreaker because now if he beats Ohio State going forward, I'm not going to get credit for it. There's no Urban Meyer over there. If this team doesn't win a national championship, it's all for nothing. So a lot of pressure on it. Thank you, Darnell. All right, welcome back to the show. Yeah. It's approval ratings time. We're going to take a look at Carson Wentz, the Philadelphia Eagles quarterback, here to help us do it. It's Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> Uncle Jimmy, uh... Mm. Gonna help us talk about mm. what are you, you a limo? What are you a yeah. limo driver? Out of work limo what is driver. That? What I look like? <laughs> black black Uber driver. You know, expensive <laughs> Uber. No. The black Uber. Ooh. Yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm a okay. pool. I'm a pool. I need somebody <laughs> on this car with me if Uncle Jimmy is. <laughs> I'm, I'm pooling today. All right, let's take a look at a highlight from our conversation earlier about Carson Wentz and Dak Prescott. Today, there's a headline in the Dallas Morning News that states the playing field between Dak Prescott and Carson Wentz has been leveled. Mm -hmm. But let's don't kid ourselves four days before the Eagles and the Cowboys meet for control of the NFC East. They're not on the same level. And it's okay. It's not an indictment on Dak. You're talking about comparing him to another young stud who was an MVP candidate before injury. Mm. Yeah, Dak and Carson Wentz level playing field. That was the argument in the Dallas Morning News. We disagreed <laughs> with that argument. Uncle Jimmy, what's your take? Why you keep making me miss with Dak, man? <laughs> oh, here we go. Get him. But you know what, man? I'm going to do what I'm paid to do, man. All right? Here you go. You ready? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. JJ from Good Times. <laughs> Ain't got enough dynamite <laughs> <laughs> to level the playing field between Dak and Carson Wentz. <laughs> <laughs> you understand that. what I'm saying? They do it. Like, whoever wrote this article <laughs> sound about as stupid as some of the articles you used to write in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Get him, Uncle Jim. Hold on, man. I was a hell of a columnist in Kansas City. Can't take that away from yeah, me. Wait, wait, wait. You all right? <laughs> I mean, wait a minute. He's a, he a hip. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You ain't no damn Ralph Wiley. I, did, I never you, said you, that. You ain't no Michael Wilbon. I didn't say that. You know that. what I'm saying? <laughs> say one more name. You gonna get him, Uncle. He gonna snap. I'm all I'm gonna say. No, okay, here you go. He go. He gonna snap. I wasn't even gonna say this, but go get him. Hey man, me and your mama, we Whoa. We, we like listening to Bill Simmons more than we like listening. to you. <laughs> <laughs> Trust I'm just gonna keep 100 with you. Let me, <laughs> I'm, you know, there you go. <laughs> what I'm saying. Hey man, we talking about Dak Prescott and Carson <laughs> Wentz. Get back on topic. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dak Prescott. It's Keith Anderson. <laughs> Keith. Ooh. Keith, uh, Keith from Good Times. Oh. <laughs> the Chicago <laughs> that married them. them. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we know yeah. them. The one black dude in the projects that had the worst luck of anybody I ever know. <laughs> <laughs> had a contract with the Chicago Bears uh, to get out. Yeah. yeah. Damn it, and JJ broke his leg. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
So <laughs> real, so real. So, That's I mean, it. what I'm trying to say, look, Dak, Dak, listen to me, bro. The Dallas Cowboys has promised you a new contract. Yeah. Yeah. Dak, you ain't never, ever. <laughs> never ever, never ever is you gonna get that contract. Oh, what? he's cheap. Oh. <laughs> you, you ain't gonna never get that contract. Something gonna happen to him. <laughs> no. Hey, look. All I'm hard. gonna tell you is this. Look at, look at. Follow Jerry Jones at the end of this season. <laughs> Jerry Jones gonna look just like Florida at the end of this season. He gonna look just like Florida Evans. Look, look Jerry Jones gonna be look, like. What are you gonna do? Damn, damn, damn! <laughs> Zachary Oswald Prescott, <laughs> damn you! Curses! Ah, I'm drowning! Ah. Oh, God, help me! Ah. Man, yeah. look, we're not talking about that. So, we're doing our approval ratings to focus are we? He's a, okay. on Carson Wentz. Hit him with the focus. <laughs> the Florida. <laughs> Job performance for Carson Wentz, I got him at a 17. All-time greatness, I have him at a four. He didn't win the Super Bowl, Nick Foles did. Character 21, <laughs> authenticity a 23 for a total of 65. I have him as a role player right now. Oh, man, I got a little more love for him. Yeah. That was a shot. Nick Foles won the Super Bowl. He got him in <laughs> position. He was an MVP yeah. candidate. Don't use that against him. A uh, little more inflated for me because I got a little more love for him. 18 job performance. Quarterback rating almost the same as last year when he was an MVP candidate. All-time status. You're going to think of him in a higher light than a lot of these young studs out there. So respect for his character, authenticity. The guy's out there shopping for shotguns. Perfect character and authenticity? No, he bought his whole team shotguns. Mm -hmm. Only someone with perfect character can get away with that. Because that anybody somebody, else... That's a lack of judgment, if you ask. <laughs> a real lack of judgment. Hey, Marcella. He is who he is. Yes, hey, Marcella. Sir. What's up, baby? What good time character would you say Jason was? <laughs> Jason? Bookman. Booker. <laughs> Booker. We got Booker. Booker up in the night. Hey, something wrong with my plumbing, Booker. <laughs> now we up in the big leagues. I did love Did not turn that back.